Coming up, Juno surfs over Jupiter. Cassini takes a look at Saturn's rings. All that, and Ben has an interview with Dave Disler, an update on the EM drive. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Orbit 10.05. Still not sure if Ben was going to open the show without me. I don't know what's going it's, on it's anymore. It's the thing I would do. It's this thing is, I would do. Yes. This is for February 4th, 2017. I'm Carrie, and of course with me is Jared, and now, for some reason, Ben. That's because Hollow Mike is uh, in for repairs. Uh, of course, <laughs> behind us, we still have a Dutta, and at the top of the show, we always want to give a huge shout out to our Escape Velocity patrons. These are the people who have given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. And as always, we are very, very grateful for your love and support. Uh, we appreciate every single one of you. It's, it's a, it warms my heart to see your names up here on our screens. How's that? Yeah, yeah, that sounds, sounds great. good. I like that. It's, I didn't practice it at all. In case, if you would like to see your name on our screens, you can always head over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, so we. I'm gonna uh, start with Jupiter. You're gonna. Okay. I like Jupiter. Great. Yeah, There's... I figured this is normally a Jared story, but I saw this. I'm like, this is amazing. Check out this is a picture of Juno right here. Dada, thank you. <laughs> this <is a> picture. <laughs> Are you calling me fat? Go <laughs> <Come> on. <laughs> <laughs> there's there, there's Juno that launched on August 5th, 2011, via an Atlas V rocket. Uh, it entered it entered Jupiter's orbit on July 5th, 2016, at 0353 Coordinated Universal Time. You know, oh, there's actually a time called Spacecraft Event Time. Yeah, I should have gotten that, but I didn't. Um, now, here's the thing. The flight plan for Juno called for it to fire its main engine on October 19th, 2016 to send the spacecraft, spacecraft into a much tighter 14-day orbit around Jupiter because right now it is in a 53-day orbit around Jupiter. However, there was a problem with the check valve on the propulsion system. And because of that, they decided not to perform that maneuver. So it's currently in this really long 50-day uh, 53 day orbit around Jupiter. That is beautiful. That's yes, like the color now, of my hair right now. That's from Juno's cam. Juno, Juno cam. Juno's, Juno, Juno, Juno cam. cam. There you go. Sure. Uh, and they are actually releasing these images to the public mm -hmm. and you can go in and you can like do some color correction and you can tweak these images and they've actually got a public posting uh, for all of these different images. And that's actually what, part of what the story is for the first time uh, the Juno team has solicited votes from the public to select the pictures that Juno Cam would be taking during this most recent flyby. And that flyby came at a blazingly close 4,300 kilometers or 2,600 uh, wow. miles, excuse me, over the top of Jupiter's clouds. And that happened at uh, 1257 Coordinating Universal Time last Thursday. This is actually a picture from Juno Cam that I took and color corrected and tweaked and made it look like that. So that's pretty cool. Now there is actually another picture. I think it's the last one in the deck. Yeah, that is one. Wow. Uh, I can't. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, that that was another one that came from. I can't read it. I'm just gonna walk closer to the camera. It's from Eric. I was gonna say Robert. Uh, it's from Eric who color corrected that particular image. Now they're actually uh, still mission management still debating what they're gonna do about this because right now the engine is still in this kind of like. The, the valves are sticky, basically. What mm -hmm. should take a second to perform is taking, uh, or less than a second to perform, is taking multiple seconds, right? So it should be kind of like an on-off maneuver, and it's more like an, uh, I'm open. Right. And now I'm closed. So uh, it is working, but not like they expect. So they're trying to decide, okay, do we leave it in this really long 53-day orbit, or do we try to fire the engine and actually take that orbit time down. And the reason we want to take the orbit time down is you can do more science, right? If you're orbiting Jupiter every 14 days, there's more stuff you can do uh, than if you're orbiting every 53 days. Now, it doesn't mean 
Uh, see, I say more science. You can still do the same amount of science. It just takes Such more time cool to yes. do the same amount of science. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's the other thing. This is one of my favorite logos from any mission. I just dropped this into the rundown because I thought it was cool. I love the Juno logo. I think it looks so... That is something that looks like on a future... Like you're watching Star Trek or some yeah. sort of other future. Yeah. Like you would have that emblem on your shirt. I love the Juno logo. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, and actually, uh, Dada, do me a favor. Go back to the original image, the very first one, Zero One. Uh, one interesting thing about the Juno spacecraft is most spacecraft have this kind of like gold, rad hardening um, mm -hmm. uh, around it. Yeah, we've seen uh, a lot of other spacecraft yeah, for this sure. This one, we actually had, a, Carrie Ann and I had the opportunity to see Juno on the ground before it launched. If you go back to Space Vidcast years ago, uh, you'll actually be able to find us doing a little space pod on it. We, we, we and again, thanks to uh, Jim Adams yeah, for actually, that. Yeah, actually, absolutely. This one, it looks like it's just covered in uh, foil. foil and duct, duct tape. tape. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really kind of cool looking. That's actually pretty much how it looked on the ground other than mm -hmm. the solar panels were folded up at the time. Yeah. yeah. Unlike most spacecraft, it's actually made out of, it has a titanium vault built into it that protects it from Jupiter's radiation. Which so. is in insane, intense, yes. right? That's, they actually had to find yeah. a different hardening mechanism because of how incredibly insane Jupiter is. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's kind of buzzing by the top of Jupiter's clouds. I mean, it's getting really, it really close. Yeah, and yeah. it's moving at insane speeds too when it, it does is, that. It is, I believe, now the fastest spacecraft that humans have ever built faster than Voyager, question mark? Um, it's up there. I think the Helios probes back in the 70s were the fastest. Hmm, I thought so. Voyager but I know Juno, Juno's definitely one of the fastest. I think it might be the... Uh, chat room, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Juno is now the fastest, but I don't know if it is the fastest without that engine burn. It yes. was supposed to be the fastest. I don't know if it was with or without that engine burn, though. Mm -hmm. So there yeah. you go. Good question. So Juno's still doing science over Jupiter, really close, even without a working main engine. Uh, Chris yes. Radcliffe in the chat room says, okay, this is why we need 4K. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Aren't those, the, I, I just thought those images were stunning. All, all from the Juno spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so from Jupiter to Saturn. Yes, and more stunning images as my well. Planet, my planet was bigger than your planet, I'm yeah, just saying. Yeah, your planet is wow. bigger than your planet, but my planet's so nice they put a ring around it. So. Yes! <laughs> Cassini has taken the <laughs> best views ever of Saturn's rings, and what you're looking at here is images of the rings sort of near edge on, and we're talking all the way down to one pixel being 330 meters in size. Uh, there, there have not been images with this kind of resolution of the rings ever before, and it's current, Cassini is currently in a series of orbits that grazes just the outer edge of the rings, and it's what allow, is allowing for these excellent views. Um, now, these up-close views of the rings are going to continue until late April, and then Cassini will enter into its final orbit where it will be threading the 2,400 kilometer gap between the rings and the cloud tops of Saturn, and then eventually in mid-September, they're going to deorbit Cassini into the atmosphere of Saturn and take data wow. all the way down. But look at this. This is unbelievable. They're literally able to look at the rings with this, and they've been able to find these things that they call propellers, which are basically these big, uh, sort of big um, groupings of where ring material is denser than other places, and this is where moons are beginning to form hmm. in the actual rings. So, these so we're looking in the rings of Saturn right now. You're looking into the rings of Saturn with this image. So how big of a really swath crazy. of that is, right? Because I'm looking at all that fine detail. Uh -huh. Like how how tight on that ring? I don't have a point. This is of about forty no contacts. This is about this is about roughly fifty by fifty miles. Oh wow! wow. So ultra ultra close up. Yeah. Image here. So there's a lot more stuff there than I guess I ever imagined. I always pictured it as being like. Just a bunch of debris kind of floating around. Yeah, well, what ends up happening is the gravitational interaction with the moons of Saturn and the rings that are that are close enough um, will actually put these uh, these little sort of like lanes of material in the rings. So that's where you see a lot of that coming from is the actual gravity interacting and moving the material around. Huh. So. Cool. And that was and that was that that wasn't like a time delayed image where things are smearing up the screen, right? That no. was like a that was like a really quick snapshot in time. Yes. So that's actually what it looked like. Yeah, the rings are made of ice, so they're very very bright, which means that you can take very quick image, uh, very quick exposure images with it. So yeah, hmm. pretty amazing. Very cool. Very very cool. Yeah. All right, Ben. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a good segue for I this have, one. I have two very similar stories. Right. Yeah. So Juno. 
uh, had an, <laughs> had engine problems, uh, and that engine actually is known as the uh, uh, Laros engine. Uh, mm -hmm. is the engine that had issues. Uh, well, there's a Laros engine on Intel Sat 33E, and a month before Juno had its issues, it had the same kind of problem. So there you go, there's a uh, picture of Intel Sat 33E. It launched August 24, 2016 on an Ariane 5. Uh, the rocket did deploy Intel Sat 33E into an on-target elliptical parking orbit. Now from there, the satellite needs to circulate it, circular, circularize, uh -huh. that's hard to say, there you go. its orbit, uh, basically uh, putting it into the correct position around Earth. However, that Laros main engine, which was supposed to file multiple times between August 27th and September 4th, didn't work correctly, which meant that because their primary thruster had malfunction, they had to go to redundant thrusters. And they have just now, as of last Sunday, three months later than they were supposed to, and there's a picture of it in, the, uh, uh, in its clean room, uh, three months later than they're supposed to, uh, was able to put it into service. Now, because they had to use the backup thrusters, that 15 year service life that it's supposed to have has mm -hmm. been reduced by approximately 18 month. months. Months. Wait, it's plural. been reduced to 18 months? By 18 months. By 18 so months. So a little bit more than a year, about a year and a half or so, okay. has been taken off of the life gotcha. of that satellite because that engine did not work as correctly. So instead of five years, now it's like three and a half years, give or take. Or you 15, 15, 15, sorry. Yeah. So instead of 15 years, it's 13 and a half years. Yeah, you, you, you got it, exactly. Okay. But the good news is it's now in service. It is now in its circularized orbit. It's where it's supposed to be. It is functioning. They were able to use those thrusters. So both Intel Sat 33E and Juno ha are both in a position where, okay, their main engine isn't working correctly, but at least they're able to do what they're supposed to do. Man, mm -hmm. I bet stock in Laros is going down, eh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I, mean, gotta, I, I don't know if it's actually the exact, to be clear, I don't know that it's the exact same issue on both. I don't okay. know if it's sticky valves on both, but it is the that engine that is not working properly on both. All right. That yeah. model brand. Right. Not, not necessarily a good thing. No, yeah, no, that, not yeah. good. Sounds like not that good. But the yeah. fact that they had the support systems and redundancy in place on both both spacecraft to be able to continue to do what they needed to do, science on Juno and ComSat on uh, Intel Sat 33E, very good, pretty awesome. Yeah. All yeah. right. Great, great engineering. Very nice, uh, Jared. Other things about other things. Yes. I, I've, I've, other things uh, about uh, I mean, other things. That's the shirt for this show. Other things about other things. Yep. Orbit 10.05. Yep. yep. That's Very what good. I'm going mm -hmm. with. Well, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the first Falcon 9 launching from Pad 39A because it was originally scheduled to be Echo Star 23, mm. a ComSat launching from that. But NASA has moved up the CRS-10 mission to be the first launch from Pad 39A. So it'll look a little something like this with your uh, Dragon capsule sitting on top of the Falcon 9 launcher out at Pad 39A. Uh, now Pad 39A is noted for its history because Apollo 11 launched from Pad 39A and STS-1 also launched from Pad 39A as well. That and is a beautiful picture. Isn't that, that's mm -hmm. one, I've got that in my room still. You can tell that was STS-1 or 2 because of the white external tank, which yep. they stopped painting white after STS-1. Yeah, that's STS-1 specifically. That's why I got that, because it's such a beautiful image of such a beautiful vehicle. So, um, now, the third launch uh, from Pad 39A with SpaceX is SES-10, which is expected to be the first flight of a reused Falcon 9 first stage. And then later this year, Falcon Heavy will make its debut flight from Pad 39A as well, hopefully. So um, we'll, have to <laughs> we'll have to see what the manifest brings and what the schedule brings. And best of luck to SpaceX getting Pad 39A up and going. Um, so... Cool stuff. They're Very saying in the it. chat room that orange looks better than the white tank anyway. I agree. I disagree. I think the white the white stacked vehicle looked amazing. I mean, it looks amazing, but it doesn't have that classic feel that the orange tank does. It only has that classic feel simply because it flew for so long in that orange configuration. The classic, classic feel is all white. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> the, that's the OG version, but I'm a bit biased because orange is my favorite color. So. Oh, there you go. So. Actually, you know, my favorite picture of the space, everyone's like, oh, that's my favorite. My favorite picture of the space shuttle is Space Shuttle Enterprise in Vandenberg. 
it has that hill. Oh, you know that? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if we have. Yeah, it has a hill really cool. kind of in the foreground and the red structure that it's attached to. It's a, yes. It was a, that, that is just an incredible picture. When they picture. were test fitting it. They were test, yep. Before mm -hmm. they were getting ready to do uh, polar launches with the space shuttle. There was also a great image that came out of there um, of the space shuttle kind of, there are these hills on either side of the, the road that the space shuttle has to go up. Uh, there are these just incredible picture of them like n nicking out part of the hill so the wings would clear it. It's, yeah. It was just absolutely stunning. Yeah, that was that would have been amazing living here in Los Angeles and being able to watch space shuttle launches. Oh, yeah, that would so, have been really cool. I mean, that would have been really cool. We can see launches from Vandenberg here in L.A., so I would imagine that a shuttle launch would have been unbelievably obvious from Vandenberg. <laughs> so. <laughs> that rattling noise you get from the solids. Uh, and speaking of epic imagery, I put this story in the rundown simply because uh, I thought the pictures were... Uh, stunning, and this is uh, Worldview 4 has entered service. Uh, these are this is actual imagery off of Worldview 4. Now, Worldview 4 launched on November 11th, 2016, on Atlas 5. Speaking of Vandenberg, it launched from Vandenberg. Uh, now, these are high resolution imaging satellites, they have a resolution of a, about 30 centimeter. Uh, of about 30 centimeters or so and, and that's what you get so that's the a 30 centimeter resolution is basically what you see on the picture on the screen right there it's sharp enough to distinguish between cars trucks vans uh, you can even read some street markings uh, you can again as chris ratgrack said earlier this is why the show is in 4k uh most of these actually had to be scaled down to fit our 4k window uh which is uh, absolutely stunning um they had this uh, up in testing for about three months and it just entered service. And so what you'll be able to do, uh, governments or companies or whoever needs it, we'll be able to task the satellite to shoot certain areas and see over certain areas. Uh, so here you could task to look at your shipping fleet to see how it's doing, see where it is uh, you know, in the ocean, see what traffic looks like. And actually there is another, I think it might be the next picture, Dutta. There's one, yeah. I like this one. This is my favorite because you can actually see the individual cars in the street from a satellite in space. I think that's nice. Uh, that, and that's that's not like a military anything. This is a private company that has this satellite up there that will allow, I mean, looking at this, A, this is definitely not Los Angeles because there aren't enough cars on the road and there are too many, there are way too many lanes for it to be Los Angeles. It's not super congested. Uh, but you can look at, you can look at a place like Los Angeles. You can look at some of these congestion points from space and go, oh, hey, well, we can do X, Y, or Z. You can make some um, informed decisions uh, based on what you see from these satellites. What I want, personally, I would love to see a company like Worldview 4, or like Worldview, uh, it's not Worldview, it's... Um, um, digital Globe. A digital, thank you. Uh, I'd like to see something like that with, I want to task, I want tomorrow to get uh, one of these satellites that can do video and task it over each of the launch sites, and I want to get a launch of a rocket from space looking down at 24 frames a second high def as the rocket's coming up. It, it wouldn't go straight at the satellite, that wouldn't be, but you'd be no. able to kind of, yeah, and I want, I want a couple angles. I want one looking straight down, then I want one kind of looking over the curvature of the Earth a little bit, so you can actually see it kind of come up and go over. I think that would be, imagine that live launch coverage. That's what I want tomorrow to do. We need to make that a Patreon goal. I was about to say, what, what goal level right, is that right. going to be that for Patreon? That needs a Patreon, Patreon goal where we can, we, you know, and maybe with the advent of uh, these uh, nanosats, uh, picosats, maybe we can actually do something like that. Yeah, Put it cool. in some sort of funky orbit. I don't know if Lagrange points too far out, but put, put it somewhere uh, where we would be able to actually capture some of these launches from space. How incredible would that be? That I would love sick. to see that. Yeah. Chat room, uh, Citizen Big Number says this is some CSI level resolution. Enhance! Zoom uh, in and enhance! Johnny Spacer enhance. says that would be really cool to have a subscription to Worldview. Um, oh, yeah. Mr. Magbar says this is actually kind of scary. And uh, Future <laughs> Martian says enhance, type, 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 enhance, type, 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 type. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, so it is kind of scary, but what's even more scary is consider that this is what's available to the public now. Right. Imagine what governments have. And have had for a long time. It's got I think, good stuff. Yeah, I think I think my moment of like realizing how advanced the government satellites were is when the DOD, the U.S. Department of Defense or National Reconnaissance Office, I'm not sure which. I guess they're all part of the same thing. Um, gave essentially a Hubble to NASA, mm -hmm. a spare Hubble that they had. And you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Except that wasn't looking out into the cosmos. That was looking 
down. down on Earth. Yes. And then you're trying to run like what that imagery must look like. You're like, oh my gosh. And that was left over from what, the 70s, 80s, something like the that? The chat room saying two spare Hubbles. Two spare, yeah. <laughs> hey, NASA, we got two Hubbles. <laughs> you guys need anything? <laughs> and they're like, now you tell us. Can we hook you up? <laughs> yeah, no joke. All that trouble we went through. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. So, yeah, I mean... Well, I mean, the Hubble, if I remember correctly, Hubble is sort of co-designed with a certain, with spy satellites, if I remember correctly. Oh, maybe. It's I had no idea. Based, if it's based off of a platform that was used by Lockheed Martin to develop hmm. imaging satellites, if I remember correctly. Chat room can correct me about that. Oh, correctly. and they will. They will. So, they will. Yeah. They totally will. Um, so, OSIRIS-REx, Jared... Yes. Well, One love, of my favorite missions. I love this particular the name for I know it shouldn't be called Osiris Rex. It has very little arms. That's what I'm saying. It, <laughs> that's <laughs> what it reminds me of <laughs> precisely. Uh, but it's so yeah, tell me some more about that. Okay, so it's doing a really cool thing, which is a mission of opportunity. So missions of opportunity are considered like these little extra goals that a spacecraft gets to do mm -hmm. during its time when it's uh, like on its way to somewhere. Okay. Like Galileo flew by a couple asteroids on its way to Jupiter mm -hmm. and it did those as both tests for engineering systems and missions of opportunity to get okay. some data. Nice. So OSIRIS-REx is doing a very cool mission of opportunity, which is going to be looking for Earth Trojan asteroids. So you may be asking yourself, what the heck is a Trojan asteroid? Well, Trojan asteroids sit at the Lagrange points, specifically L4 and L5, in a planet's orbit about 60 degrees from that planet. Wait, wait where are L4 and L5 in uh, relation to? They are L2 is in between, what's that, Earth, Moon, isn't, isn't L2? L4 and and L5 are basically these 60 degree or these points 60 degrees off of the Earth's orbit, and it's where the balance between the Sun's gravity and the Earth's gravity meets at. So, so okay. So it's it's like L1 and L2, but it's further out. But it's way further out. Okay. It's about it's somewhere on the order of over a hundred million kilometers. Out. Okay. So it's pretty wow. far away. Yep. Um, but if you put something there. It stays there, or at least it tends to stay in the same general area. Well, Cyrus Rex is actually approaching the L4 point of Earth on its trajectory, um, on its way to do a Earth flyby later this year. And from February 9th to February 20th, they're actually going to turn on the imaging systems on OSIRIS-REx and take 145 images a day of the L4 point and see if they can actually find any Trojan asteroids there. So we only know of one Trojan asteroid that the Earth has, and it's not really fitting the definition particularly well because it's sort of if this is the plane of the solar system here it kind of does like a horseshoe orbit up and down we're more expecting a trojan asteroid to kind of go within the plane of the solar system mm. with it um, now they're expecting to find objects as small as 100 meters across so this potentially could allow us to find Trojan asteroids, and Trojan asteroids are found all throughout the solar system. Uh, Jupiter has Trojan asteroids, Uranus, Neptune, Venus, and Mars have Trojan asteroids. And the reason that they're very difficult to find here on Earth is because of that 60 degrees of separation. That means that you would have to look in the daytime sky in order to look at that point. And, well, doing astronomy during daytime is uh, a little bit difficult. So, unless you're looking at the sun. You just, <laughs> so. you just shut the sun off. Yeah, you, you turn, turn this sun you look, off. You look in the other direction. You just wait until it's nighttime on the sun. Right. right? Yeah. So when the sun goes yeah. to sleep. So. Yeah. That's the mission. Yeah. Nice. nice little Actually, opportunity. There is a little bit of an irony that if you look at the Osiris Rex spacecraft, it does have these teeny tiny little satellite like. Uh, like these it does arms. have a robotic arm on it. Oh, is that a yeah, but it looks yeah, like. Yeah, if you go back to it, see, it looks large, large right? But arm. it's like it's like these two little like. <laughs> T Rex, T Rex like uh, <laughs> solar panels on it. All right, let's go to break. Yeah, perfect. I yeah, Ben took over, so that's fine. We're <laughs> that's what I do. Yep, <laughs> that's what I do. I'm sorry. Yep, yep, that's fine. No, totally my segment. So we're gonna go to break, <laughs> and when we come back, Ben gets to have his very own segment with an interview with Dave Disler. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with this segment, I did want to give a shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. These are Escape Velocity members. We also have our Orbital subscribers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, late last year, we actually talked about the EM drive, what we call the impossible drive. Uh, this is a drive that seemingly defies the laws of physics. And we have brought Dave Disler back on, an EM drive engineer, to talk about this. Now, uh, last time we waited till the end to mention this, and I, I'm, I'm going to mention this up front. Uh, Dave is an expert in his field. He knows his stuff. He has 35 years of experience in microwave and RF technology. Uh, we're going to be talking about microwaves and, and, and things like that. Don't take your own microwave apart. Don't do these tests on your own. This is very dangerous stuff, right? So it, it's cool. He knows what he's doing. So it seems like he's like, you know, I'll just kind of hacking around and work, but he really understands what's going on here. So please do not try these, these experiments at home. On that note, Dave, welcome back to the show. Uh, there have been a few changes uh, uh, in the EM drive, but before we get into those, can you give us just a quick refresher? What is the EM drive? EM drive is a uh, basically a device that uh, resonates at microwave frequencies and uh, its particular shape uh, called a frustum uh, for those into geometry and it resonates um, one end's a little larger than the other end and all you do is you dump uh, all the RF into it. Uh, there's a picture of one right there I see. Uh, so yeah, that was my uh, that was my second version of it. And with that RF, without any other propellant, it just uh, actually has motion and does move um, in the direction of the small end, at least on my experiments, that's what's been happening. So with the electrons, you get movement. And, and that, that shouldn't be, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the uh, right. part of the, the, what am I trying to say, the... the Anti-Newtonian anti physics, I think, is what a yeah. lot of people like to say. Yeah, right. I mean, you, you know, you, you look at a rocket and you've got a chemical reaction creating thrust. It's, it's expelling propellant. Um, it's, that's what's creating its movement. But here, there's, there's, nothing, there, there's nothing there, right? You're getting thrust out of essentially nothing. Well, yes. And uh, the, the whole concept of the M-Drive is that it's not a closed system. In other words... Um, it's got to be interacting somehow outside that uh, cavity and it's got to be connecting or coupling with energies or fields or forces outside uh, to be able to propel it forward. In other words, if it just sat there, think about a uh, think about blowing up a balloon and uh, holding it and if you tied it off and let it drop, it would not do anything. It would just drop uh, due to gravity. But if you didn't tie it off, you just let it go, there it goes because it's expelling air out of it and propelling it in one direction. Well, when you have a closed cavity like this, people are saying, well, there's nothing coming out. Well, that's not necessarily uh, understood exactly how it's coming out, but something definitely is coming out of the cavity and coupling to the outside world. I read on some of the forums, uh, I'm not a theorist, and I've said that uh, before on your show, but... Uh, uh, from from what I can from what I can put together, um, consider it like a submarine. Okay, so it's it's taking in water uh, and uh, ejecting it out, or it's got a propeller. Now, in this particular case, the propeller could be um, something like magnetic fields that are interacting with exter uh, external magnetic energy. Free space is full absolutely full of particles and, and uh, radiation and, and everything. The secret is, is how is this coupling to it and how is it propelling it in one direction or another? And we still don't know those answers, but there have been some changes since last we brought you on the show. Um, I believe there's uh, some peer review, some, some additional data. Can you go into what, what's been changed since last year? A lot has changed. Uh, my experiment, uh, when I was showing you the uh, the bits and pieces, that I think that's part of it on the screen right there. But um, I did my experiments in uh, June of last year after I assembled it. Uh, that's the white uh, cavity right there, and I did measure um, 
approximately 18.4 millinewtons of force or displacement on our torsion beam assembly. So it actually moved across, moved the beam across um, at about 18.4. The goal I had set for myself last year was 17, um, about 17.8. I wanted a hundred times improvement of the uh, force on what I saw with my first version. This was the second version I had built. So to make a long story short, I found it. Uh, it, it was slightly over a hundred times the force displacement that I had uh, uh, seen. And um, from there, I was sold. I, uh, I could scale it up uh, at home with my simple uh, homebrew torsion assembly, which is probably going on screen right there. You see it balanced on a wire. That entire beam right there is 107 inches length. Uh, the, uh, the RF cable is, or the uh, uh, AC cable carrying four kilovolts is going over to the cavity. That's a magnetron on the back of it, and it will pivot um, you know, horizontally. Uh, and I measured very carefully calculated uh, what sort of measurement uh, gives um, X amount of, uh, of milligrams of, uh, of weight uh, and so forth. So I found out that it was real. Uh, I, that was my second build. I scaled it up. And from that particular point in September, I believe, NASA released um, their paper. Uh, their paper was uh, in the AIAA journal. I think it actually showed up in the journal. It was accepted in September. Showed up in the journal in December. And as of this month, uh, NASA's uh, uh, Eagle Works has um, basically an, a full article, eight or nine pages worth, in the Aero American Aerospace Journal. So NASA did prove that they had some uh, force with theirs. They were much lower power than I was, and they generated, I think Paul told me, about 1.2 millinewtons uh, with about 80 watts or so of, of input power. So NASA believes it's real now. So, so uh, Kay McCoy asks, what's the margin of error in your measurement device? Uh, I would, there is some error. I would say I calculate this to be about plus or minus 8, 9%. Uh, is where I would uh, be uh, comfortable with. Uh, you have to add up several different things. That's one of the problems of doing it with a mechanical contraption like a torsion beam. You're, there's all sorts of errors that could happen that could be additive in there. So the the weight calibration uh, is probably within about plus or minus two or three percent. You add to that the uh, laser displacement sensor, which is uh, basically a laser that shoots out, looks at uh, a target which is actually on the beam so the laser uh, is fixed goes out to the uh, to the target which is on the beam and as it moves that accuracy on the uh, Omron laser displacement sensor is about two or three percent for displacement and then by the time you add in the uh, DAC converter uh, uh, the or the um, ADC the analog to digital converter, uh, you're adding another two or three percent. So all errors totaled there um, on just the measurement is probably about eight or plus or minus eight or nine percent of, of 18.4. It definitely is up there. Um, then the other errors that you have to be aware of is uh, air currents and so you have to watch the trace very very carefully to make sure it's not, it's stabilized a slight movement in a, in a large area like I was at, which is like a 25 by 30 area, any slight air movement uh, will cause that to move back and forth. But I did eliminate pretty much all the errors um, that I could. There is one that's being talked about right now, which is as it expands thermally, it goes off center uh, slightly. And uh, there may be weight forward or back. But what I would argue against that is that the displacement happens so rapidly. I know that solid copper doesn't heat up that quick. So, um, yeah, let's call it eight or nine percent. That's a long way to answer that question, but I'm pretty pretty confident of that. So Lars von Braun asks: Are we at a point where we can definitely say it's a thing now, or is it still kind of up in the air? Yes, it's it's definitely a thing. Um, what the external, what, what this open system is coupling to is what there's a lot of discussion about right now. Um, on a couple of my slides that I sent you, I had some frustum-shaped uh, 
um, images that had uh, various shades of green. There's there's the refrostum, but it, internally, it had various shades of green, red, and so forth. Those are uh, electromagnetic fields, and as you go to the small end of the frustum, the electromagnetic fields are more condensed, so there's more uh, uh, eddy currents in the sidewalls, there's more magnetic energy that's uh, radiating around that, and it definitely, the shape actually is doing something. It's, 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 it's condensed down to the small end and then coupling to the outside world. So the coupling is what is the big thing right now, and there's five or six theories going on right now. Uh, Professor Mike uh, McCulloch of uh, Plymouth University in England has his MIHSC, uh, which involves unruh radiation. Um, there was, a I believe, a Finnish uh, author who had a peer-reviewed paper published that it was actually pairing photons and, and ejecting those paired photons out of the backside of the uh, cavity. Um, there's a couple of people on some of the forums that have ideas. Of course, Shorier has his own idea that doesn't violate the uh, conservation of momentum, but he isn't really talking about a coupling to the outside world. It's a closed system, um, and that's where a lot of the theorists are having difficulty. But yeah, it's a real thing, no doubt about it. Are there, is there anything left pointing that it, it, Warp 11 has asked that it may not be real? Uh, like, uh, ha, could it be interacting with just something that's under pressure in 1G that j just uh, we're not seeing yet? That's a, that's a really good point. Um, for this thing to be real for space flight, I think it's real at sea level, okay? Uh, for this thing to be real for space flight, it's got to be able to work in low Earth orbit, it's got to be able to work in geosynchronous orbit and beyond. So what we're all hoping for is um, this thing to be put into a space environment, to get, a, get away from the mechanical, um, you know, torsion beam assemblies and so forth, uh, get to the outside world um, where you don't have the mechanical apparatus, let it go in space, see what happens. Um, actually, what I can announce myself is, is that I have uh, loaned the cavity that I built, the one um, that you showed there on the rock that I showed you, I've loaned that to a major U.S. aerospace company. Uh, what they're doing is they're going to be doing some uh, lab tests to validate what I've seen and then uh, enhance what I have uh, uh, witnessed as far as force. Uh, if that works, uh, then it will be pretty much a formal project and they're uh, going to launch this thing into space. So there's a lot of movement into getting it out to the world. I think you might have seen in December CAST, which is a um, the science um, directorate in China, said they have actually put one up on their uh, space station and have tested it positively um, on their space station, but have kept it really quiet. But they did announce it. Uh, it it's actually, um, you know, on the internet uh, from their website. Uh, it wasn't rumors or anything. So um, the next step is 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 uh, is taking into space to prove itself. And so it sounds like that's in work, right? So you've got kind of the ground tests going. What what's left on the ground? Have there been vacuum tests on the ground? Uh, I mean, what 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 needs to happen here before we send it to space? Yeah, NASA uh, Eagle Works did theirs in a vacuum. There, uh, they've done all their testing in a vacuum, um, and they measured the same amount of for the 1.2 uh, millinewton force with uh, you know 60 to 80 watts of uh, of input. They've measured that uh, in uh, both uh, with and without a vacuum. They measured it in by reversing the uh, frustum on the uh, test stand. And um, yeah, so I, I think for each individual company who's getting involved in it, uh, the, the company that I'm uh, working with right now uh, is they have to prove it to themselves. They have to prove it to their management. They have to uh, say, hey, this is worthwhile launching and, and putting up there. So yeah, I guess, I guess uh, the bottom line there is that once it's proven in the lab in a vacuum, um, which it already has been done, get it up, you know, get it up into space and, and see what it does. So then what are those steps in space? The first step I assume would be some sort of low Earth orbit, somewhere where it's fairly easy to get to, possibly the space station, or would it just be kind of a standalone thing? An ISS, uh, yeah, um, 
I was looking at, at uh, the NASA channel the other day and I noticed that uh, they, they were passing around a uh, Super Bowl 51 football and I was saying to myself, boy, you know, if they could just put a small little M drive, just take it up there rather than that football it would be great, you know, just actually, you know, just uh, they could be self-contained, they can be very small. Um, the one being uh, worked on in, at the University of Dresden uh, with, uh, with Paul uh, Kosila in, in uh, Germany is probably the size of a CubeSat and it's being tested in a vacuum uh, pretty much in the next two or three weeks. It, it failed its first test because it burned out, I think Paul said, an amplifier, but they're going to do some space uh, uh, launching. They've they've got uh, they've got a way to take this little guy up there and uh, turn him loose. Now, at his power level, which is much much smaller, it's a much smaller device, and and he's got a few um, milliwatts, less than a watt of power, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. But that is more for station keeping. In other words, do you have to take propellant, uh, you know, along with you to keep a satellite in its proper uh, position in orbit? Um, so his is more of a station keeping design. Uh, mine and others are, are a little higher power than that and it actually should be able to launch a small mass probe, uh, you know, straight as an arrow. Uh, so. Well, you, you mentioned higher power and you also said you're getting about 18 millinewtons of thrust. Can, how, how much power is that? Uh, can, can you put that into terms that uh, mere mortals could understand? Like, is that the equivalent of, of pressing on a brake? Uh, is it? Like uh, it's the equivalent of, of no, it's it's very small. It's it's the uh, it's the force of maybe a uh, a bumblebee landing on a flower, that sort of thing. It's it's a very light weight, but it's constant. So if your mass is low enough, you have this constant light push to it, uh, just like an ion engine. The difference between an M drive and an ion engine is an ion engine um, will run out of fuel because it is expelling uh, fuel uh, through the through the back end of it. Uh, this is not technically so. As long as you've got a, an electronic uh, or electric supply, it just keeps going and going and going. And you could use solar panels for that electric supply. It just depends on how much, how large your EM drive is, and how much force you want to apply. Right. You could um, you could use solar panels for uh, probably out close to Jupiter, and then you start getting uh, the point of diminishing returns on on electricity from the sun. Um, and a RTG would have to take over from their nuclear power, I would guess, uh, would have to kick in after that. So uh, get rid of some of the mass, uh, you know, do uh, eject the solar sails, uh, get rid of some mass so that uh, it can accelerate a little, uh, a little faster, quicker, and um, go from there. I, you know, I, I can vision the whole thing in my mind. Uh, one of the things besides, there's a lot of discussion, there's new theories coming out um, about you know, should I dump more power into it or get a higher Q or basically quality factor of the cavity? And, and I think it's a combination of both. I think uh, Scheuer and um, a small company called Kine, which is a sort of an M drive, it's not exactly, but it's the same concept. It's uh, fuelless uh, propulsion, um, are going to superconducting and they can get uh, Qs like, give an example, how I calculated 100 times force improvement from my first design to my second design was I increased the Q factor, I improved the Q factor by a factor of 10. I figured that would uh, increase the uh, the force out by a factor of 100. Um, and it's still a fairly low Q factor, it's 10,000. And uh, there are superconductive designs out there that are into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. I've never seen anything like that, and of course at home, you know, I'm not going to be able to do uh, superconductivity experiments or cryogenic experiments, but um, so more power into a, a higher Q cavity could really improve that. Let's say a 10 time Q improvement may give you 100 times force improvement. And because there's nothing coming off the back end of this, would there be a point where you could maybe scale it up and stick it inside of the space station to do station keeping? Because right, it doesn't have to sit outside the space station like a traditional engine, right? It could just be sitting anywhere you want and, and helping the station stay where it needs to be. 
once they do some mapping of the electromagnetic fields around the outside of it, that's really the next step. And I think that's what that company that I'm uh, working with is, is really planning on doing, is doing a, a magnetic and, and E-field map of what's happening outside this crazy thing to, uh, you know, both in rotational and, and, and extension outside the cavity. If, if you put that into a metal uh, enclosure, um, like the space station where I guess we're talking primarily titanium and aluminum, I'm not really sure how the fields would be affected by it. The safest thing is to get it out away from other metal. Um, you, you may notice that test that I had done on the torsion beam. I had no other metal around. In fact, the beam itself is hardwood. So I didn't want any potential interaction with anything external to the end drive. I wanted it just to be there by itself. So if they did the testing and they, 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 they started understanding the, um, uh, the magnetic field interactions um, and they found out that aluminum or titanium uh, don't impact it, but maybe a ferromagnetic material like a steel or whatever does, yeah, they could put it into the, into the space station. Um, but you gotta keep, uh, gotta keep a wary eye on how strong the electromagnetic fields are or the E fields of the H fields uh, or B fields, I guess is what they're called as well, um, outside the cavity because that could be hazardous to your health, so to speak. So we just need to make sure that we uh, make our space stations out of wood from now on and then it wouldn't be an issue. I would <laughs> make it out of the hardwood like I did. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, let's go backwards a step. Uh, Lur asked, uh, could you explain what Q factor is? Q factor is a, uh, basically you take the resonance of the cavity, you sweep it with a certain frequency and as you, as you, as you sweep that frequency, um, I made a little video of that, but, uh, and you actually had that picture up one time. It looked like a little notch yes, uh, that came down as a green go. trace. Mm -hmm. There you go. That is it right there. So what you do is you sweep the, um, uh, the cavity. It comes down to a resonance point. You take measurements on the bandwidth at the, near the, the peak and also uh, up in the, um, uh, the beginning of it, and that difference in frequency uh, is what's divided by, um, or you take the center frequency and divide it by that bandwidth, and that, that's how you get your Q. Yeah, so there it is popping up on screen. Um, the sharper that is, and I, I made mine fairly sharp, a uh, Q of 10,000, but the sharper that is, the higher the Q, and it's just like, in, in layman's terms, it's like ringing a bell. If you would ring a bell, how long does that bell resonate or how long does that bell ring? It's the same thing with RF. How many bounces do you get with the photonic energy back and forth inside this thing? So the higher Q will have more and more bounces. In other words, your photons don't decay uh, into heat. They bounce back and forth. They reflect uh, more often. And the more power you put in, the more energy is going to be stored in there. If I'm explaining that uh, properly, uh, uh, it doesn't dissipate as rapidly, so the higher Q is important. Does an M drive generate a lot of RF noise, radio frequency noise? Um, so if you had it on, say, a satellite or something like that, could, would it interfere with any of the electronics uh, nearby? If you kept the, 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 uh, the cavity that I had made, let very little RF out of it, uh, but I did detect high magnetic fields, and high magnetic fields can interfere with other communications. When I measured it for RF leakage, you know, like you would around a regular microwave, I have a little meter, I have two of them as a matter of fact, I walked around the thing and there was very little RF radiation. Um, and that's, that's something I'm pretty keen on, is uh, not uh, spraying RF out into the environment uh, from my amateur radio days. You don't want to interfere with other people's communication. Um, and um, so I did walk around and I didn't see strong RF fields anywhere, just the pure RF itself. I would imagine if you had something on top of it or uh, real close to it, yeah, you'd need to have some pretty good shielding. But, um, you know, I was several uh, feet away from it and very little RF escaped uh, that I could detect. What are your personal next steps? Where are you, what are you doing next with the M drive? Well, um, I've got the uh, I've got the NDA uh, that I've sent over to the company. Um, I would imagine once it gets into the um, uh, into the the formal project stage, 
they could count on me for uh, consultative help, that sort of thing. Myself, uh, unlike a couple of my other fellow builders, um, I'm not planning on you know building up a home lab uh, um, at all. In fact, there's M Drive Labs going up in Colorado, uh, in uh, Texas, and there's one uh, pretty well up and running uh, with private individuals uh, in uh, Georgia. Uh, that's not including what's going on uh, in uh, uh, Europe, uh, you know, Australia, and and, uh, and Asia. But I myself, I'm kind of weighing what I'm going to do. I think a lot of it has to do with how much I'm going to be involved in uh, helping them get their uh, project going. If I'm not involved very much, then yeah, I might build another version. Um, I think there's things I would like to try. I'm, you know, I can't get cryogenic, but I can certainly try different. Um, shapes, sizes. Um, I turned this over to the company, the cavity, before I started doing solid state. Uh, I wanted to move from uh, magnetron, which is a very noisy uh, uh, signal. It's hard to control the frequency and so forth. So I wanted to move that into solid state where I could put that frequency spot on where I wanted it to go and hold it there and pulse it if I needed to. Uh, that would probably, if I was doing it more myself, that's probably what I would do. But right now, I'm uh, kind of chilling after about two years of work. So, Are you happy with where it ended up, where, where you got it to? Yes, yeah, I'm very happy with it. I kept everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, <laughs> on display with, uh, with YouTube, uh, like a uh, reality TV show, I think was what I said last time. So... Every mistake that I saw, every problem that I saw, you know, like the plasma arcing that I found that I had to clean up the cavity with, uh, my attempts to do the teeter-totter worked out fine, but the teeter-totter just wasn't as good. I couldn't remove the thermal lift from the force, so I went to the torsion beam. And I'd kind of documented it, either with pictures, forum posts, or with, uh, with YouTube videos. And I think I've got uh, on my uh, uh, YouTube channel about uh, 37 or 38 if anybody has about two or three hours of spare time they wanted to look at it but it starts at the beginning and goes through uh, you know my tests of, as of last June. Uh, actually I think that leads us into a really good closing segment uh, which is where can people find the work that you've done uh, find you online and uh, just kind of follow along. You can find my channel on YouTube is probably the best way to go. Um, I post on two forums and I'll tell you about that. Uh, but for my videos, if you go to YouTube and just do a search, I'll give you the, the, the easiest search parameters to find my channel. It's 1701A, that's 1701A, and then M Drive, E M D R I V E. So 1701A space M Drive. Punch on that and you'll have all 38 of my uh, uh, videos on there. Um, I post on uh, two uh, forums, uh, doing most of my posting right now on Reddit, uh, their M Drive forum, which is, uh, you know, Reddit slash R slash M Drive, E M D R I V. A lot of good people. They're actually, um, all the moderators are, are, uh, uh, are not believers. And, and so I, that kind of keeps me grounded and keeps me uh, in check to really limit what I say. I'm not talking flying cars or, or, uh, or spaceships, anything all, but it's really been helpful and there's a lot of good conversation on there. A little bit on, on the less technical side, for those people who are more technical and want to get into the theory, the theory site that I would recommend is uh, the uh, nasaspaceflight.com forum. Um, and if they go to nasaspaceflight.com, uh, then they'll go to forums, then they'll go to um, I think it's uh, the one called New Physics. Uh, so click on the New Physics link and then I think they're in Thread 9 right now. Uh, thread 9 uh, talks about the M drive. So those are the two places right now that I've been uh, hanging my hat as far as you know my public uh, forum posts. Both are very good. Reddit, a little less technical. Um, NSF, a little more technical, especially for the people who are involved in the theory. But either place they can they can find some great information and, and I think one of the key takeaways that's different from the last time we had you on is now it appears to be replicatable right now we can repeat the experiment multiple people have repeated the experiment 
And while not everyone's getting the same amount of power as you are, I believe most everyone now is actually seeing some sort of thrust. Is that, is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Uh, there's also a um, hashtag M drive on Twitter, and Mike McCulloch, uh, Professor Mike McCulloch, uh, tends to um, uh, tweet quite a bit there, and I've done that as well. In fact, I was uh, uh, advertising uh, TMRO there for you, so <laughs> I'm letting everybody know that uh, it's going to show up today. Um, but anyway, um, he made a chart, and, and it's probably one of the most liked charts on the M drive uh, currently. Uh, it shows where 1701A, which was my M drive, where it uh, appeared in line with the other experiments, Dr. Tajmar, NASA, Scheuer, um, and um, then 1701A is, is, is plugged in there. So yeah, I had a little bit more uh, power output, uh, all but except Roger Scheuer's design. Uh, mainly because I was using a lot of brute force, 750 watts of, of power roughly that was being fired into it. So um, NASA was, was down much lower in power. So, you know, power and Q and, and so forth really will make the thing successful. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. It's been a great, it's been a great experience. I don't know if I'm done yet, uh, um, but uh, for now, I'm, I've been quite pleased. 1701A, so I, I'm going to have to assume you're a Star Trek fan? Uh, never heard of it. <laughs> All right, yeah, 1701A. I, 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 the first one I called, I nicknamed 1701, and then I did 1701A. And who knows, I may do 1701B uh, this, this summer, but uh, probably going to take a little bit of time off since I've been so actively involved in it for um, for a couple of a uh, couple of years, about two and a half years. All right. Before we let you go, we have just some general questions that we're uh, asking all of our guests this season. Uh, oh, no right or wrong answers, um, uh, as long or as short as you want them to be. Uh, the first question is: uh, Moon or Mars first? Uh, I would say this is uh, this is beyond Mars. Beyond Mars. All right. Uh, would you go? Yes. When do you think humans will first land on Mars? Uh, 2035. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Mm, 2025. And why space? Because it's there. <laughs> Dave, Always fantastic having you on your show. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, look forward to seeing one of your M drive. By the way, I, I pronounce it, at least in the beginning of the show, EM drive. I heard you pronounce it as M drive. Is there a right or wrong answer there? Is it M drive? It's, it's both, Ben. So uh, I really want to give uh, you and your staff, I uh, uh, want to commend you guys for uh, talking about the M drive because, or the EM drive, because a lot of people are still kind of iffy about it. The peer review changed that. And... Uh, it was a you know peer-reviewed paper in AIAA uh, that there's still some questions about how the thing works, but you guys have uh, stepped up to the plate and, and started talking about it. I noticed that uh, some of the uh, EM drive shows uh, that you've had, have, I think the last two, uh, Orbit 9.14 and 9.16, um, total combined uh, was like 50,000 views, so that's not bad. Yeah, well, you know, it... If it, if it is a thing, if it does work, and I'm not sure I'm completely convinced, I'm more convinced now than I was in season nine, uh, but if it is a thing, it could be a, a radical game changer for uh, exploration of the cosmos. Uh, and so I really want it to work, uh, so I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, we'll see what happens when we put some of these in space. I, I'd really like to see one in space, uh, no pressure, and um, uh, limited gravity impacting it and see what it does. I think that's going to be the ultimate test here. Absolutely. That, I would agree with you 150%. All right, Dave, uh, please don't be a stranger to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us. Give us comfort. Help us find our way. 
we see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know. Our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into the comments of our show from last week, we want to thank all, all of our Patreon members. Of course, we'll start with the Escape Velocity Variety, who give us $10 or more per episode, and our Orbital members as well, who give us $5 or more per episode. But we also have our suborbital members. These folks give us $2.50 or more per episode, and they get early access to After Dark. And then we have our ground support members who give us at least a dollar per episode, and they get their name in the show and access to Google Hangouts, and we have them. So if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And of course, I'm back here, joined by Carrie Ann and Ben, and we are going to go ahead and get right into the comments. Capcom! Yay! That's me. That's you. That's, yep. That's... You even said it on your banner earlier like... in the show. It said Capcom Carrie Ann. Yes, it did. It did. It, it did. Mm -hmm. It's really unfortunate. Right, there you go, right? Yep. But... Right Boom. there. Capcom mm -hmm. Carrie Ann, right there. Capcom. So it says, also, flight... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Dada. Well done. <laughs> oh, that was perfect. That's what Post is for. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so uh, previous show topic, of course, was Jim Adams, uh, who's the former Deputy Chief Technologist of NASA... Very, very cool interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, this first comment comes off of YouTube from Rune12358. It says, uh, the color of the Boeing suit, the CST-100, lands on land. Very few blue-colored landscapes on land, but a fair few that are somewhat orange. Because mm -hmm. we were talking about, like, why they were blue as opposed to being orange. Uh, you know, we're so used to seeing astronauts in either all white when they're doing the spacewalks or... Um, or the orange ace, uh, advanced crew escape... Suits. Right, or so, kind of a, yeah. I mean, my shirt but kind of comes off as have, orange. Shuttle used to have blue, sh blue suits, the light yeah, baby blue. Yeah, flight suits, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a, yeah, yeah, the light blue. And then when uh, astronauts fly anywhere, the jumpsuits that they wear are kind of a, that same sort of Boeing blue. Royal blue. Yeah, yeah. royal blue yeah. kind of situation. Um, so, I don't know, it just looked funny to me, I guess, and uh, the question kind of came up. But that, that's a really good point. If the CST-100 lands on land, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, a, a blue suit is going to it's going to be, what am I trying to say? It's going to show up. Thank you. Those are the words easier, I need. So, Appreciate yeah. that. Appreciate yeah. that. There you go. All right. So uh, next comment comes off of also YouTube. This one comes from Behemoth29. It says, uh, f apparently at four minutes and 48 seconds. Oh, my God. I love the Coral of Cross. Yeah. That's uh, that's this right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. Yeah, so cool. that, uh, that is Indeed, very, very cool. And let's do this in slow motion now. Yeah! Ooh, there it goes. Look at them boosters Absolutely. flipping. Absolutely. Now, I, I think the reason Dada put this in here, at least the little note that he added, is yeah. that um, the live uh, production of all these rocket launches is increasing and getting cooler and better. This was uh, an Ariane space launch of a Soyuz rocket. 
Is that right? Yeah. Yes. R E S. Right. It's just a lot of things that don't seem to normally go together. Right. Um, None of the uh, words in the sentence make sense. Uh, and I will say, uh, I have always <laughs> thought that Ariane Space does a fantastic job with their webcasts. Uh, yeah. I, I love the Rumble in the Amazon Jungle. Right. Uh, PA, <laughs> right? He is my favorite <clears throat> rocket launch announcer of all time. He is always so excited. Uh, they have the cool telemetry on the screen. Uh, they give you a lot of really great data. They keep you engaged and informed as to what's going on. Yep. Um, I just think they do a really great job. And uh, much to Dutta's point in the show notes, I think a lot of the launch service providers are starting to step up and actually do some really great coverage and get us some really amazing shots from space so you can see things like that. And um, I, I just, in, the next step back from our news segment is getting that worldview four type view <laughs> of a rocket launch. This is what, this is what tomorrow needs to do. We need to get that, that top down, uh, looking in kind of like sideways from space shot of the rocket going into space. I just think that would be super duper awesome. Or what tomorrow should do is when we get, reach a certain Patreon goal, maybe, um, we, we get a subscription to like worldview and then we, we loan out that, like the citizens of tomorrow can choose what we're going to look at. And we get those snapshots, and that becomes a Patreon reward. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be cool. cool. I'm pretty sure that you know, so leasing that satellite time is millions of dollars. So not anytime soon. But all right, next up, Capcom. All right, next one also comes off of YouTube. This one is from Ted Blackburn, saying, "Can you imagine if all that billions of dollars in James Webb Telescope gone if the Ariane Five would go wrong?" Uh, well, I mean, Ariane 5 has a very good track record. Yes, it does. Right? I mean, if so, history yeah. says anything, the DoD probably just has two extras anyhow, right? <laughs> well, that's not... <laughs> that's funny. Thanks. Also, good, good tie back to the news. Well Thanks. done. That was well. Do what right. I can. Good job. Um, uh, yeah, that would suck. Although, to be fair, I think a lot of the cost of the James Webb Space Telescope isn't the building of the telescope, but the R&D to figure out how the heck to make it actually work. Yeah. Right? That, that's, that, I mean, they were literally right. doing things that had never been done before. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking a telescope and you're chilling it down to absurdly cold levels and then keeping it that cold for years at a time. So, right. But now that we got it, I yeah. mean, it, yeah, it won't be cheap, but... It won't cost the however many billions of dollars it eight costs. Billion, right. Eight billion. Eight billion. Well, that's the current price tag. I, I assume <laughs> it's continuing. The, the telescope that ate the budget. <laughs> yeah. Can, every year, year after year. Omf, 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 omf. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that would, that would suck. But I don't think... I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> Moving on. All right. Because I just want the data. Right? Uh, this one also comes <laughs> off of YouTube. I think these all came off of YouTube Yeah, this they week. did. Um, this one comes from... I'm going to... Imagine this is Grosser Salad. Sure. Yep. That says, what an amazing guy. Thank you for the interview. Uh, yeah, Jim is so... You're welcome! So much fun to talk <laughs> to. Oh my God, he was amazing. Yeah. He was really cool. He was absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, he just has so many stories from... Well, and he kills me though, because he's just sort of like... He presents it like it's not a big deal. He's like, I mean, I've got a story about that. Did you want to hear it? <laughs> and we're like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, do I need I... to breathe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Like, and a lot of people in the chat room last week were like, oh, he should write a memoir. Like, he doesn't know what he's doing oh, next. Oh, yeah. Like, he should totally write this stuff yeah, down. Yeah, should. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be, be pretty cool. so awesome. Uh, I'm working with him on hopefully some upcoming shows as well and some other things, uh, some neater things. I don't want to promise anything yet, so I'm not going to say what we're working on, but... Uh, I had some interesting ideas after that show, so I, I, I do not believe that will be the last time we see right. Jim. Well, on and tomorrow. so did Jim, so that's yeah. that's really cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, it really, just really. Well, I mean, he has so many years at NASA, and he's worked on so many huge programs like Stereo, Juno, uh, Mar Mars Science Laboratory, just these huge projects that he was, you know, a major. Uh, part of well, and I think what uh, differentiates him from a lot of people that we have met and interacted with at NASA is that he kind of worked with a lot of the different uh, centers. Thank you, centers. I'm like stations. Uh, That'd so, be cool. That, that would also be cool. <laughs> yes. uh, NASA's I mean, Jupiter station calling in. Right, but you know what I mean. So, <laughs> so he doesn't. He has a much more global view of NASA and all of the dinner, sure. different inner workings and what have you. Uh, which is, you know, it's just a different perspective, which was really yeah. cool. That's awesome. Yeah, right? All right, All right. next up. Uh, next one comes from, uh, off of YouTube. It says, uh, from <laughs> Doug, the D, the big DP. Um, Yo. Yeah, so the there's that. The big DP. I, sure, I, we'll go with that. Uh, it says, I would say, just like 10.04, that it doesn't matter how long it runs, because I would have been happier with longer, but more if it was interesting. Let it run and see where it goes. 
You could have done two hours in the show and nobody would have left and there would have been other times when people would be checking their watches just after five minutes. Yeah, this is talking about the duration of the show. A, a lot of people get a little bit upset because we kind of, we check our watches <laughs> during the show so that each segment doesn't doesn't run long. By the way, every week each segment runs long. Still in a case, long. In case, you're, the, in case you want to play the Tomorrow Home game, here's how it works. Every <laughs> segment is cut into 13 minute increments. Which means the total time of the show after breaks and everything else comes mm -hmm. out to approximately 42 minutes. I cannot tell you the last time we've had a show that was that short. Yeah. Right? We yeah. always go over an hour. But you, there is something to be said for not letting it go on for two, three, or four hours right. and being consistent. You know that you're going to get a show that's around an hour long each week. You know the kind of quality you're going to get from it. You know the kind of content you're going to get from it. Hopefully it's good quality. Hopefully you like the quality. Hopefully you like the content. Uh, but the time, time does matter. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say we have to hold to it. Right. Obviously, we didn't last week with an hour and nearly 40 minute show. Right. We went almost an hour longer than we normally do. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't want to do that every single time. Also, for those wondering, there is a cost involved to that. Yeah. Right? We host these on iTunes. That all is on Amazon S3. Every time you download the show in iTunes, that costs us money. So, uh, you know, the longer the show, the more money it costs us. Yeah. yeah. And the more popular we get, the more money it costs us. Right. I, I mean, that's offset by Patreon. Sure, sure, sure. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, that's why we do it that way. Uh, I don't foresee us changing that anytime soon. We will. Con Those seem to be good time targets for us. Mm -hmm. If we go long, okay. If we go short, that's okay, too. We go about as long as the content dictates. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I've beaten that into the ground. Next up, Capcom. Great. Uh, last comment comes off of YouTube from Philip Matson. This one's a little bit longer, so bear with me for a second. So I could use some further insight on these Lunar X-Prize milestone challenges, particularly considering the mention of capturing footage of an Apollo mission. Now I'm all for collecting and sharing such material, but my concern is that the, what distance would this be performed? Are there a set of regulations in place to set a perimeter around these locations? And if not, should there be? And as I said, seeing footage of Apollo Oh my god, it's a two-pager! ...would be cool. I would just hate to see Neil's footprint get tore up by a college student with a state-of-the-art RC. Historical site rules, I guess I'm hinting at. Uh, anybody have any info on this, I'd appreciate some data. I almost read that as Dada. <laughs> <laughs> we would um, all appreciate some, some Dada, Dada, by yeah. the so way. So, if I were to summarize that, um, are we going to destroy the landmarks that are the Apollo landing sites on the moon? I think there are active... Uh, I can't speak to this with a lot of intelligence, but as I understand it, there are... Um, rules and regulations with GLXP, the Google Lunar X Prize team, to mm -hmm. basically not do that. They don't mm -hmm. want you to get super close to these things. They want you to kind of stay back, not ruin the tracks, not ruin the landers, right. things like that. Uh, that d doesn't mean that it will always be that way. And um, who knows what other countries are going to do. But in general, mm -hmm. I think as a whole, humanity... That was a moment for humanity, not just for the United States. Well, and then the other thing is that the people who are involved with the Google Lunar X Prize, uh, any of them who do get a rover on the moon, I think have a hefty respect for those sites in right. you know in keeping their historical preservation yeah. anyway. Um, I, I don't think you're going to get a college student just kind of going, oh, that's really cool, and going over like Neil's footprints, for instance. And, and I don't think we're going to see other countries doing that either. Right. Generally speaking, yeah. I think everyone's going to... Um, honor and preserve those landmarks, at least through our lifetime, yeah. I think. We're pretty sure, but you can always double check the website. Uh, Google Lunar X Prize, of course, has a website with a lot of different uh, guidelines, and they do talk about the different milestone challenges, uh, as well as any sort of, uh, you know, keep out zones that they've already yeah. prepared. So. All right. That's our show this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Next week, we've got Ralph uh, Ewig. I, hopefully, I pronounced that right. We'll find sure. out next week. <laughs> who's the CEO of Audacity Space. That is a, a space-based communications network, much like the TDRIS system, the tracking data relay satellite system that NASA uses for uh, communicating with their spacecraft. But this is a privately owned system. So I'm really excited mm -hmm. to talk about that. Yeah, Actually, cool. going back to next, last week, uh, we talked with Jim about uh, the Deep Space Network and TDRIS and how they all kind of play together and how important these networks are. Well, here we've got a privatized version of that network, uh, which will be pretty important as humans start landing on Mars and doing other things out in space. So I'm excited to bring him on the show next week. Uh, for those of you watching live, stay tuned. After Dark is up next for everyone else. It'll be available in about four weeks. Thank you so much. See you next week.